to do to do, do any juggling on this panel? Okay. Okay. Just, uh, we're straight now. Okay. We're good. 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 Okay. The guy that was a roller from VRE. So. A what? A train. Okay. So he. Okay. Uh, that's good. Who was it? James Burton, the ordinance. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. All right, that's fine. Was he supposed to be on this panel? No, the first one. Was that on Bud? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, we want to welcome our, our second panel and want to thank you for your willingness to come forward and help the committee with its subcommittee with its work. Uh, it is the custom before this committee that all witnesses providing testimony shall be sworn. May I please ask you to rise and raise your right hand? Do you, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give to this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay. Let the record reflect that all the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Uh, as, you, as you saw with the first panel, uh, the green light will indicate you have five minutes uh, to summarize your written statements, with a, which have been accepted into the record. Uh, the yellow light indicates that you have one minute remaining to summarize your statement. And the uh, red light means that your uh, time for a statement has expired. Let me introduce our, our first, uh, excuse me, our second panel. Uh, Mr. Addison Davis assumed his duties as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army for Environment, Safety, and Occupational Health in 2005. Uh, Mr. Davis provides executive leadership for the Army Environmental Policy Institute and the Army's four regional environmental offices. He serves as the executive agent for a number of critical Department of Defense activities. Colonel Peter Mueller is, uh, excuse me, assumed command of the Baltimore District in July four, on July 14, 2006. Uh, Colonel Mueller's major command and staff experience include assignments as the commander of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Charleston District in South Carolina. He is a registered professional engineer in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Mr. William C. Early was appointed Acting Regional Administrator for the Environmental Protection Agency in April 2009, temporarily leaving his post as Regional Counsel. Mr. Early has received several bronze medals for his efforts in support of the Regional Hazardous Waste Enforcement Program. Mr. George Hawkins, George S. Hawkins, is the Director of the Department of Environment for the District of Columbia. He launched and now chairs the Mayor's Green Team, which coordinates the district sustainability programs across more than 40 agencies. With that, I would now like to open it up for opening statements. Uh, Mr. Davis, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Tad Davis, Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army for Environment, Safety, and Occupational Health. And I'm pleased to have the opportunity to testify today on the Army's activities at Spring Valley in Washington, D.C. As one of my other duties, I serve as the Department of Defense's executive agent for the formerly used defense site program under which Spring Valley is being addressed. My testimony will briefly discuss the FUDS program and the issues you identified in your recent letter. I would like to say up front that the Army will not leave Spring Valley until the work is done. Based on investigation results and ongoing efforts, the Army anticipates completion of the majority of the field work at Spring Valley at the end of calendar year 2010. Although this means that there will be fewer visible signs of Army activities, like trucks and trailers on site, the Army remains committed to its efforts to protect human health and the environment at Spring Valley. We understand the concerns of the Spring Valley community and assure you and the public that the Army will continue to work with our partners, the D.C. Department of the Environment, the U.S. Department of uh, Environmental Protection, as well as the community, to ensure that the work is completed in accordance with prescribed regulatory standards 
and with the intent to ensure the health and human safety of the entire community. We will continue to work hard to keep our activities related to this site as open and transparent as possible. I would also like to acknowledge the role that Congress has played in availing the funds necessary to discharge our responsibilities at Spring Valley and at other FUD sites around the country. Funding for the FUDS program has stayed relatively level for the last several years, approximately $11 million a year at the Spring Valley site. However, the program has received annual plus ups from Congress that have allowed us to accelerate work at high priority sites, including Spring Valley, which received $4 million of funding above the original allocation for fiscal year 2009. Uh, so essentially for 09, we had $15 million of funding. The FUDS program is part of the overall Defense Environmental Restoration Program, or DERP, established by the Congress in 1986. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers executes the program under my supervision as DOD's executive agent for the FUDS program. This program is responsible for more than 9,000 sites transferred from DOD control prior to 1986. Given available resources, the Army uses a risk-based prioritization approach based on site-specific conditions. The Army first addresses those sites with the highest relative priority before addressing sites of a lower priority. At this point in time, the top priority within the FUDS program is the Spring Valley site. The Army complies with the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, or CERCLA, for site characterization and remedy implementation at FUDS. We actively work with regulators who set and enforce the appropriate standards necessary to ascertain the cleanup is protective of human health and the environment. Further, the Army engages the community to ensure its concerns are understood and that their concerns are considered as well in the process. The Spring Valley FUDS encompasses the former American University Experimental Station, where during World War I, the Army tested chemical agents and presents, as has mentioned already before, the challenge of investigating and remediating legacy chemical weapons materials in a densely populated metropolitan area. Emphasizing safety, accountability, and transparency, the Army invited the D.C. Department of Health and later the D.C. Department of Environment, as well as the EPA, to enter a working partnership with the Army for the Spring Valley cleanup. I firmly believe, Mr. Chairman, that our partnership at Spring Valley to date is a strong factor in the success of our efforts at this FUDS project. As pre previously stated, the Army is nearing a key milestone at Spring Valley. Based on these Army's investigative efforts and site data collected using the best technology and expertise available, the Army developed a cleanup plan that was carefully reviewed and agreed upon by those partners. The plan projects that the majority of field work will, in fact, be completed by the end of 2010. We will then begin an extensive data review and report writing phase, which may last up to several years. Further, the Army is committed to working collaboratively with the community and respond to discoveries of contamination caused by past military activities that may pose a threat to human health or the environment. Last year, the Army plans to use the ex explosive destruction system to neutralize chemical munitions and conventional munitions that contain a non-chemical agent. We will probably be able to go into more detail on that process um, during our discussions. In closing, the bottom line from the Army's perspective and that of DOD is doing the right thing with regard to the Spring Valley site. That's always been our intent and will continue to be uh, in the future. The Army has acted responsibly at this complex site continues to coordinate actions with its partners and strives to keep the community informed on project progress. Uh, I welcome the opportunity to be with you all today uh, for this important um, hearing, and we're committed and look forward to working with the members of this committee as we continue to clean up efforts at Spring Valley. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Colonel Mueller, you're recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman Lynch and members of the subcommittee. I thank you for inviting me to address you today in the Spring Valley Formal Use Defense Site uh, located in Washington, D.C. I'm Colonel Pete Mueller, Commander and District Engineer for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Baltimore District. We serve as the Army's Executive Agent for Spring Valley cleanup activities, and we are responsible for managing and overseeing the successful remediation of this site. Spring Valley, as we've heard, consists of 661 acres in northwest Washington that was used by the Army from 1917 to 1920 to conduct chemical warfare research. It's currently occupied by approximately 1,300 residential homes, 22 embassy properties, American University, other schools, churches, and a uh, small number of businesses. The Corps began investigating Spring Valley in 1993 
to address hazards left over from past Department of Defense activities. During this time, we recovered chemical warfare material and munitions and explosives of concern. The technical and stakeholder involvement challenges inherent in a chemical warfare material and munitions and explosives of concern investigation within a residential community require active planning and communication between the Corps, the Environmental Protection Agency, DC Department of Health and, and the Environment, uh, and the community. As a decision-making agency responsible for accomplishing this mission, our in-state goal is to achieve agreement between our Spring Valley partners and the community to identify, investigate, and safely remove or remediate threats to human and environmental health and safety resulting from DOD activities. Today, I'll summarize the key aspects of achieving a successful mission to describe our ongoing and future tasks at the site. A crucial element of, to successfully clean up any FUD site is learning and understanding its history. Spring Valley is the most comprehensively researched site in the history of the FUDS program. Our historical research includes interviews with those most familiar with its past DOD activities and a 1993 review of American University's experimentation station records, which yielded approximately 14,000 line entries of data. Another critical component of the project includes the array of tools and methods that the partnership uses to effectively communicate with the public. First, our project team follows a congressionally mandated process that requires public input from key partners, stakeholders, and community members at each critical decision point. Second, we have implemented additional methods that include, among others, establishing a restoration advisory board, tours and regular face-to-face -face meetings with individual community members, mailings, as well as an active website. As part of our ongoing cleanup activities, we continue to test for and remove arsenic-contaminated soil from the property site. To date, we've cleaned a total of 106 properties and removed more than 24,000 tons of contaminated soil. Over 98% of the approximately 1,500 property owners have agreed to testing and removal program. We expect to finish the, resi the uh, residential soil removal uh, effort by the end of this calendar year. We are also managing a very active program to search for and recover military munitions. In March 2009, we completed a high probability pro portion of the investigation and removal of Pit 3 in the Glenbrook Road area area known to contain uh, uh, buried chemical munitions. Its removal is an important accomplishment. As a result of the investigation of Pit 3, we have, we have recovered munitions that contain chemical agent, and we plan to safely treat and neutralize the chemical munitions at the Spring Valley Federal property later in 2009 using a mobile treatment system. At the same, that same technology was used at Spring Valley in 2003 to safely destroy 15 chemical munitions. All planned work at this property should conclude later this summer. We continue to collaborate on and actively investigate groundwater in two areas where perchlorate levels exceeded guidelines. We've completed two phases of the investigation and currently are on our third. The results so far indicate that the Del Carlia Reservoir is not at risk from the perchlorate in the groundwater. And phase three will install an additional eight groundwater sampling wells to join that 43 wells already in the network. While we do have planned milestones for completion of these elements of field work, I want to assure the subcommittee there is nothing that prevents us from discussing with the partnership the need for additional work. If the partnership believes that more needs to be done, then more work will occur. With that said, we are planning on completing most of the remaining field work by the end of calendar year 2010. Though our field work may come close or come to a close, we'll continue to advance in the congressionally mandated process by completing a remedial investigation and feasibility study. Uh, which is collected from our field work and involves consultation with stakeholders and the public. We will allow the facts and the data to guide future work. I assure the committee that we remain committed to our purpose for as long as it takes to get the job done, and I'm highly confident in our ability to achieve our mission for the Army and, most importantly, the community of Spring Valley. I thank the committee for the opportunity to speak, and I'm prepared to answer any questions. Thank you, sir. Mr. Early, you are now recognized for five minutes. Chairman Lynch, Representative Norton, and members of the committee. I am Bill uh, Early. Mr. Early, I believe your microphone is off. Can you hear me now? I believe so. Thank you. Chairman Lynch, Representative Norton, and members of the committee, I'm Bill Early. I'm the Acting Regional Administrator for EPA Region 3 in Philadelphia. Which I don't believe that microphone is working. It's not. Can I? Let's try this one. I apologize for that. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah, much better. Okay, Thank you, much sir. better. I'm sorry. Okay. Once again, Chairman Lynch, Representative Norton, and members of the committee, I'm Bill Early. I'm the Acting Regional Administrator for EPA Region 3 in Philadelphia, which includes the District of Columbia. With me today is Stephen Hirsch, a remedial, uh, the Senior Remedial Project Manager assigned to the Spring Valley Site Cleanup. 
I am here to provide the committee with EPA's perspective on the ongoing efforts to clean up the formerly used defense site in the Spring Valley neighborhood in the district and to address current issues which are of concern to the committee and the public. EPA has been providing technical support to the U.S. Army for its work at the Spring Valley site since the initial discovery of munitions in 1993. Because the area is categorized as a FUD, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has been and continues to be the federal agency with responsibility for the cleanup. The EPA, the Corps, and the District of Columbia have developed a partnership management team to work together on the Spring Valley cleanup. This partnership continues to function effectively, with each partner's organization maintaining its respective role and mission in the cleanup of the site. EPA's participation at the Spring Valley site has been and continues to be significant. EPA has expended over $2.6 million conducting technical support activities at the site. EPA has brought expertise and capabilities which the other partners either do not possess or were not able to employ in a timely manner. EPA has extensive experience in cleaning up contaminated soils and residential areas at numerous sites across the country. Contaminants of concern at these sites include a variety of hazardous substances, including arsenic. The technical issues presented at Spring Valley soil contamination may be challenging, but they are not unique. The investigation and cleanup work at the site has progressed steadily over the years, addressing three primary areas of concern, arsenic contamination in soils, buried munitions and disposal pits, and potential groundwater contamination. However, there are many other tasks yet to be completed. The partners have developed their priorities with community and stakeholder input with the goals of investigating contamination and eliminating unacceptable risks to human health and the environment in Spring Valley. All significant cleanup areas requiring investigation and cleanup have a project management schedule. The partner's Spring Valley cleanup schedule is a living document which has been amended as necessary over the years based upon site conditions and discovery of new information. Associated with contaminated soil removal is EPA's issuance of letters to residents. These letters explain to homeowners that all necessary contaminated soil removal actions have been completed on their properties. The letters are important to homeowners, particularly when real estate transactions occur. The partners have agreed to give priority to ensuring that each homeowner affected will receive a letter as soon as possible after their work on their property is completed. Currently, the Corps is conducting geophysical surveys of a large number of properties to investigate the possibility of buried munitions and other remnants of the Army activities during World War I. The Corps, EPA, and the District have agreed upon a method to determine which properties will be geophysically investigated. Unlike the arsenic sampling program, geophysics is not planned for every property at the site. The partners anticipate that the residential geophysical and follow-up investigations will be completed in 2010. The groundwater investigation is continuing. This year, the Corps will be installing additional shallow wells, in addition to better understanding the nature and extent of perchlorate and other chemicals in groundwater, the Corps is planning to install deep monitoring wells, something not previously done at the Spring Valley site. <coughs> Lastly, I want to address the issue of community involvement in Spring Valley cleanup. As you have heard, the partners hold a large number of regularly scheduled meetings. The Corps, EPA, and the district are always available to talk or meet with residents on an individual basis. The site is being investigated and remediated in accordance with the National Oil and Hazardous Substances Pollution Contingency Plan. So there are specific processes the Corps will follow in developing documentation that presents all of the previous cleanup activities and assessments in a single document. As required by the NCP, the Corps intends to prepare a remedial investigation report. This document will summarize all sampling and cleanup actions taken at the site and will include a baseline human health and environmental risk assessment. The risk assessment is a key document in determining if all necessary cleanup actions have been conducted or what additional cleanup actions need to be completed to address unacceptable risks. The document and the proposed remedial action plan will be available for public comment and will be the subject of one or, of one or two public meetings. In closing, EPA believes that the Spring Valley cleanup is progressing in a positive manner. Community and stakeholder concerns are heard and are being addressed. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak before the committee. Thank you, Mr. Early. Mr. Hawkins, you're now recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman Lynch, Congressman Chaffetz, and my Congressman, Congressman Norton, members of the committee. 
My name is George Hawkins. I'm the director of the District Department of the Environment. Thank you for the opportunity to present testimony at this oversight hearing on the environmental restoration program of the Spring Valley formerly used defense site. I am joined by Alex Baco, who is the division director for our toxic substances division, as well as Jim Sweeney, who is the branch chief of our site remediation branch. My objectives this afternoon are to describe from our perspective the manner in which the District Department of the Environment works in association with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to facilitate the ongoing planning and execution of work activities at Spring Valley. Furthermore, I would like to emphasize some of the recent and ongoing efforts that DDOE, the District Department of Environment, has established to foster and encourage communication with district residents. As you may know, the District of Columbia works to resolve this matter under a 1994 agreement with the Department of Defense. This agreement provides reimbursement to the district for providing technical review and guidance at installation restoration projects at both active military facilities and formerly used defense sites within the district. Our goal under this review process is to ensure that restoration work is performed in compliance with District of Columbia environmental laws and regulations and that work is protective of the environment and human health. Currently, our attention is mainly focused on three sites, the Washington Navy Yard, which is the only Superfund site in the district, Bowling Air Force Base, and of course, Spring Valley. The district's environmental program has been involved with Spring Valley projects since June 1995, when two environmental specialists in our agency were hired after a record decision was issued stating that no further action was needed at the site. It was the work of these two district staff members that ultimately resulted in the Army Corps returning to Spring Valley and has brought us to where we are here today. Since the Corps has returned, we have been involved in partnering process with them and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to ensure that the highest quality of work is done to investigate and remediate the contaminants left behind by the Army after the World War I, after World War I testing in Spring Valley. The partners meet on a monthly basis and no work is initiated. No work is initiated unless or until all three partners agree on how to proceed. If either the district or P EPA or both disagrees with the proposed plan or procedure, the action will not and does not occur. Currently, there are two major issues which our attention is focused, the ongoing groundwater study and the planned on-site destruction of chemical weapons. We have been discussions for some time concerning plans for the next phase of groundwater investigation. The district has absolutely been at the table and has had strong views at how this should be conducted. And recently we've come to an agreement on how this work will in fact be accomplished. We expect that a new round of groundwater sampling will occur later this summer or in the early fall. The district is interested in the groundwater results for two principal reasons. The first is the obvious need to determine if contamination, particularly perchlorates, is potentially affecting the Delacardia Reservoir which supplies drinking water to the entire District of Columbia. Even though sampling so far has indicated that the reservoir has not been affected, we have been concerned that perchlorate contamination may reach the deep aquifer. For that reason, we have insisted that the Corps conduct deep well sampling, as been noted the first time at this site. The second reason to continue groundwater sampling is hopefully to assist in locating the source of the perchlorates that have been detected in the groundwaters at higher levels near the American University campus. Locating the source of the perchlorates might help us in locating one or more yet-to-be-discovered burial pits that have been mentioned in some of the historical archives. In response to the proposed on-site destruction of chemical weapons, DDOA has been briefed on the Corps of Engineers' conceptual plan for this activity. Clearly, the use of explosives for on-site destruction of munitions requires the cooperation of several district agencies besides the Department of Environment. The District's Homeland Security and Emergency Management Agency, the Metropolitan Police Department, the Fire Department, and the Health Department have all been briefed by the Corps of Engineers, and all agencies are currently reviewing the plans for this event. District government sign-off on this plan will occur after reviews have been completed by all agencies. If, agency has, if any agency has concerns on the plan, then approval will not be, occur until all uncertainties or questions have been satisfactorily addressed. While these are two major issues right now, there are several other efforts at Spring Valley which appear to be near completion. We believe it is premature to suggest that work is complete. What is, will be completed in 2010 is planned field work. There's, our view is likely to be more work suggested in the future as the result of sampling that has not yet been conducted. It's planned field work that will be completed, not any additional field work that's indicated as necessary, either by the next round of groundwater sampling or additional site review that's going to be done near the Delacardia Reservoir. 
We have thought it's prudent, however, to look at what ought to be the criteria to close the site. The issue of closure criteria was asked once before in 1995, and as I mentioned, it was DC's environmental program that determined additional work was necessary, and the Corps returned. Since then, tremendous work has been done. Burial pits and chemical weapons have been found. Tens of thousands of samples have been analyzed. Scores of properties have been remediated. Additional scores of properties have been geophysically surveyed. Many of these properties have been dug up in the hopes of finding munitions. Still work, ne work needs to be done. This is a unique site. There are tough questions, and it's complicated. We will ask the right and tough questions in 1995, and we will continue to ask those questions before there's any decision to walk away. The Department of Environment pledged to continue to act aggressively for the environmental advocate, for the citizens of Spring Valley. We've devoted many resources to the cleanup of the site. We've planned activities bringing specialized groundwater and hazardous waste, and have just hired a toxicologist who will bring new resources to bear on decisions for this site. I realize I have used my time. Um, we have in continued to also work more with the citizens. We are, more, we are planning additional meetings one-on-one -on -one with the neighborhood commissioners near the site and have devoted a new part of our website to this site specifically to make sure all information that's needed for the site is available to the citizens. I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Hawkins. Uh, let, me, let me begin just by saying uh, I, I think the community has sounded some measure of alarm over the idea that uh, planned field work is, is concluding. And uh, I think it's, it's the, the reaction is actually born in the experience that they've had already where there was a clean bill of health given to the site and they found, you know, more contamination, significant contamination, and that uh, a thorough job hadn't been done in the original analysis. So there's a, there's a lack of trust, but it is, it is probably well-deserved. Uh, let me ask, it, it, from a technological standpoint, are we using every uh, state-of-the-art technology to investigate the site uh, that, that might be available? Mr. Davis? I, I would say, yes, we are. And in fact, some of the uh, technology that was discussed earlier was, in fact, uh, you tried and used unsuccessfully based on the uh, interference in the local area. The ground penetrating radar that was discussed was in fact tried at the site. Um, and again, that's one of the challenges we have, Mr. Chairman, is, is when you go from one site to another, you try to, you know, site adapt the technologies um, that are available uh, to include emerging technologies that might be used on that site based on the source and types of contamination um, that we're looking for. Um, but we don't have blinders on. We are continuing to look for new technologies uh, that we can bring to bear. And I think that in our groundwater uh, monitoring plan that we're going to maybe talk about a little bit later, uh, we're bringing in some things there that will enhance our ability to um, better determine if there is any uh, groundwater contamination. The only other thing I would tell you is, is that we have a uh, National Defense Center for Energy and the Environment, which really does a lot of uh, research and development. Uh, projects um, for the DOD and uh, projects associated with uh, cleanup at many of our sites, both our active sites and our formerly used defense sites are part of that process. And so we are continuing to, to look at new technologies and we're also partnering with um, the private sector. And I think many of you may know that in many cases the expertise that we bring to these sites uh, is done by private contractors and so we seek to get the best of those contractors and the best technology available to bring to these sites. Colonel, you feel comfortable with that, that assessment in terms of uh, all the technology that's available being used? Yes, sir, I do. And in fact, I think it also goes back to the partnership and the discussions that we can have where each of our, our agencies will bring different ideas and different experiences to help seek uh, the best alternatives. Um, we will tend to use industry standards. Um, one thing that we've hesitated to do is use something that's going through uh, research and development because we want to use uh, proven techniques. But one example where the community involvement, I think, drove us to another technology was with the arsenic removal. The community indicated they was there an alternative to digging up yards. And so we went back to our engineering uh, and research laboratory uh, in Mississippi where they had been using fire remediation. They had had uh, proven tests where fire remediation using plants could actually extract arsenic from the soil. This was one uh, application that was uh, fairly modern that we used and actually have used that to clean up 19 properties. Okay. 
One of the, uh, well, I, I believe in reading the testimony last night, uh, as recently as a year ago, we've, we've discovered munitions. It just, you know, and that's fairly recent, and we've been on this site for a while. Uh, it just seems to me premature, I think, to, to say, okay, we're, we're done with our field work, our planned field work, and we're going to move on. I, I just think that uh, there's a need to provide, uh, you know, further activity here. I don't know, you know, I, I know you've got a lot of uh, points of interest, and, and you've got a lot of test wells there, monitoring wells. Uh, I'm just concerned whether or not uh, this decision to conclude field work is premature, uh, given the recent findings. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I did like the testimony uh, offered by uh, Ms. Mattel uh, from GAO earlier in, in, in this hearing about a very aggressive and robust uh, monitoring process that would continue uh, on the site, uh, at least in the near future. Let me, let me ask you, um, is that something that you, you envision? And uh, I also want to know about this destroying some of these munitions on site. And that, you know, that must cause a considerable amount of anxiety in the neighborhood that you're, you're operating in. Uh, is there not a better technology? I know transporting uh, chemical weapons is a dicey proposition in any circumstances. Uh, you've got a heavily populated neighborhood here. Uh, is there not a better uh, better way to do this than destroying them on site, notifying the neighborhood, scaring the heck out of them? And, you know, there's, there's got to be a better way than this, guys. So if I could take that Mr. one. Secretary? Um, uh, yes, sir. The, uh, if I could maybe address the EDS, the explosive detonation system that we're going to use for the destruction first. Um, this is a technology that has, has been proven. Uh, we've used it uh, throughout the country. We've had over 1,500, uh, you know, documented uses of this system to destroy, you know, chemical munitions at different sites um, throughout the country. We currently have uh, in storage on federal property adjacent to Sibley Hospital uh, the munitions that would be destroyed during this um, destruction process. Are they conventional or are they chemical weapons? Combination of both, sir. Okay. And um, in the 2003 destruction, a similar uh, system was brought in and set up uh, using all the safety control mechanisms that are available, and we'll be doing something similar. We've got some enhanced monitoring devices that we have now that are newer than the ones we used back in 2003, uh, but the site will be set up. And again, as was mentioned by my colleagues here um, at the witness table, uh, a lot of coordination, a tremendous amount of coordination has already gone into and will continue to go into uh, planning for uh, and then conducting this process uh, using, you know, all of the existing technologies that are available um, and then some. And um, I think also the safety procedures will be in place as well, working with the local first responders within the district um, to be on site and to provide uh, their assistance. Um, we, again, have done this at locations throughout the country, uh, and we currently do not uh, make a habit of transporting uh, chemical munitions from one state or from one jurisdiction to another um, for uh, destruction, which is one of the reasons why this exportable uh, system was developed uh, in the first place so we could bring it into a site and then uh, safely uh, set it up and destroy the munitions on site. Um, and then minimize the risk associated with that um, particular activity. Okay. I know my time has expired. I just might offer the, the uh, possibility that, that the, com the committee may want to go out and visit uh, the site and look at that operation because I, I am not entirely convinced. Okay? Sure. And, sir, we do, we do have a uh, – normally when we do these around the country, we have a leader's day set up uh, once the site is completely set up and we will coordinate with the committee so that they can come out and we'll walk them through um, the system and explain all the procedures and the protocols that we will have in place um, before we actually begin the destruction process. All right. I have abused my time. Uh, I, I'm going to thank you, Mr. Secretary, and I'm going to yield five minutes to 
our ranking member, Mr. Chaffetz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. M uh, Mr. Early, if I can start with you. Are, are the residents and those who work in Spring Valley, are they safe? Um, that's something I think we are continuing to um, address in terms of our, our So you action. can't say yes? Well, um, I think we're addressing, uh, as a result of the partnership that we have Sorry, here. You Mr. Early, can you hit that mic again for some reason? Yeah, or move it closer, I think it's... Yeah. Is that better? You can't say yes. Well, I said that I think we are moving to address the concerns that the citizens have. There were a number of things that have been pointed out at that particular site that we have been, um, as a result of the partnership here, been addressing. Um, there are a number of concerns, soil contamination, groundwater contamination, and other things, as well as the uh, explosives that, that um, I think we've been okay, looking so the at. Answer These is are not yes, is that correct? Well, I think we are moving to, to make them safe. Um, there, are, there are hazards there that I think that we, as a result of the partnership that we have developed here at this site, which I think is unique to um, this type of situation, to, to diligently address all of the hazards that are, are present at this site and address them in a responsible manner. Uh, Colonel Mueller, the residents and people that work there, are they safe, yes or no? Sir, they're getting safer every day. The, the current environment there, um, we would not be there if the, the site was totally safe. Obviously, we're looking to make sure that we find everything that we possibly can that's left over from that time. I am comfortable that we have all the controls and measures in place uh, to make the, that community as safe as it can be until would we complete the study. Would you live there right now? If I had a paycheck that would allow me to, to live there, yes, sir, I would. <laughs> um, let, me, uh, let me ask uh, Mr. Mr. Hawkins here. Um, have the re residents been exposed to contaminants that would increase their risk of disease or dysfunction? It is possible that they have been exposed to contaminants that could cause a health problem. Um, as you've heard, there have been a series of short-term health studies in the past. In the past council, D.C. Council session, $250,000 has been allotted to our agency in fiscal year 2010 to do more, a more in-depth health study that's been suggested by Johns Hopkins. That's not enough to do the full study that, that has been envisioned by the previous Johns Hopkins effort. We think it is well worth it and are searching to determine whether other funding sources are available. The question of whether anyone has been harmed, my guess would be is that there, that there are health consequences to the contaminants that have been at the site, as there are in many sites around the, the country. I believe we're taking the steps necessary to eliminate those threats. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Davis, uh, this has taken certainly considerably longer than anybody had est estimated, anybody wished. I, I, what went wrong? Why, why is this taking so long? I would, would say that I don't think any, anyone has done anything wrong when you look at the, the program that's in place right now. And I, I share your concerns, uh, just like everyone else, of the time that it's taking. Uh, but as you go around the country, as I get the opportunity to do and look at a variety of sites, um, in many cases, um, you see the same thing, that the site takes longer well, that's, because... that's not very reassuring. Well, but let me get... <laughs> what, what, but is, is there a, was there a flaw in the procedure? I mean, I, 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 on the one hand, you admire a, a group and an agency to take a, an estimate. The, the risk is always that you're not going to meet that estimate. But now, reflecting back, given that perfect vision, what went wrong? Why is it taking so long? Is it procedural f failures? And if this is happening above and beyond Spring Valley, why is this a, a flaw that continues to happen all across the country? Well, again, I don't, I don't see it as a flaw, but what I would tell you is a lot of these sites that we're dealing with, like Spring Valley, go back 60, 70, 80 years, mm -hmm. where you're dealing with incomplete information. And uh, for instance, uh, you know, we have misperceptions today when we watch shows like, you know, NCIS or uh, some of these other shows where they solve three different crimes in the, in the span of, you know, 45 minutes. Uh, with perfect information. And in many cases, we're dealing with imperfections here. We're dealing with information that no longer exists, records that were not kept uh, to begin with. And so as we go back through our archival efforts to try to piece together everything that happened, that forms the basis for uh, the initiation of efforts at these sites. And I can assure you that it is a comprehensive effort. It includes records. It includes, uh, if they're still alive, actual interviews with people that were on these sites, overhead photography, and a whole host of things um, that have taken place and provided documentation. From that, 
we develop the initial estimate on what work needs to be done based on the nature and type of contamination at that site and then proceed with the cleanup effort. Um, once you start digging uh, in the dirt, uh, you find different things. All these munitions that have been fired at different locations um, throughout the country, we will go out and do geophysical mapping to try to identify, you know, various anomalies that might be there. Uh, when you go out and you actually start digging things up, um, you may not dig up, you know, what you thought was there. And so it may take a little bit longer than you had originally uh, anticipated. So it's a, it's a deliberate process, but in many cases, as we're going through that process, we are continuing the archival research. We're continuing to engage people that might have been there, adding new information uh, into the situation to develop it uh, as precisely as we can uh, to guide the effort forward. Uh, and the other it, consideration, if, if I may add, sir, is that we uh, are also continue our concern for those people that are working at the site and those people that are in the local community. And in some cases, uh, we just can't go out and start our work. We have to get a right of entry to go into that property. And in some cases, as we've seen here at Spring Valley, for whatever reason, um, the residents or the owners of some of those properties are reluctant to provide us a right of entry so we can go in there and do the investigative work and the follow-on cleanup if needed. So there's a lot of different variations here that impact on the timetable and our ability to get the work done. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the extra time. I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton, for five minutes. Uh, I, re I recognize the position, uh, particularly that the, the core is, is put in. Uh, we're dealing with very old munitions, very deeply buried. So the only thing we can uh, judge, uh, it seems to me, is what uh, standards or criteria are being used to determine um, when to leave and when the job is done. Um, well, let's, let's take the two-year work plan. Who has seen the two-year work plans that you have said that you believe the job will be done in two years? Where is the two-year work plan? Ma'am, the, the work plan is one that is built by uh, the partners. Uh, what? The, the work plan is developed um, by the partners. I would have to step back a minute to, to um, describe exactly where we're at, and I'll try to do that quickly. Um, the, the area of interest task force um, that involved all the partners looked at um, all the issues, everything that we had uh, characterized. And that task force came up with 28 areas of interest. To date, um, we have analyzed 14 of those. There are 14 areas of interest still to be evaluated. All the partners, as we go through the, the findings and the results of what has been investigated, then take a final action to look at what else may need to be done. So really the area of interest evaluation for, for the uh, overall site is what has driven that, but there's a different process for the arsenic, and then there's also geophysical surveys of properties um, that are also a part of that work plan. So there's there are different. Uh, yeah, are you are, are are you using the work plan now? Is that what you're saying? I'm I, I'm trying to determine uh, what it is that that makes you know that in two years you'll be through and. And what is the plan, the exit plan okay, yes, that you're using? Ba based on where we are today, um, we have analyzed first the historical studies, and then we've analyzed everything we can to identify items of work that need to be done. Once we complete this work, there will be a uh, remedial investigation feasibility study that is published. Um, everything that goes into that will analyze all the work that has happened to date. That gets vetted with each of the agencies, including DC, uh, EPA, the community and will include a 30-day uh, review by the public. That document will characterize all the work that has been done. When will the material be available to the public? Ma'am, that would not be um, complete until we complete the physical work on site. So as we mentioned, the physical work, that current work plan identifies actions that we are taking by people on the ground, contractors and workers cleaning and investigating the site. The the feasibility study and the final um, remedial investigation is a document that will characterize the whole site and will then also go out for public review, agency review, and that will determine, again, if there's additional work um, or if we've been completed. Ma'am, if I could add one quick comment on that. The, the work that's being done now has, in fact, uh, been work that was vetted with the partners and developed in consultation with the regulatory agencies 
uh, to drive the way forward. It's in brief uh, to the community via the Restoration Advisory Board meetings um, that take place on a monthly basis. And so it's, it's more of a work in progress now where we have goals and objectives that have been uh, established. It's a work in progress is public. Yes, ma'am. Uh, 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 if the community or the district wanted to know what weapons um, ha uh, you, you have discovered on site, uh, would you give them a list of such weapons? In fact, why haven't these weapons, weapons been mm -hmm. given to the uh, uh, community? I mean, they're old. They're, 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 there's been some sense of, of uh, 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 national security concerns. Indeed, those words have been used. Uh, it's, it, it's very difficult to know how there could be national security concerns about World War II uh, munitions. I think it goes back to the, to the fact, ma'am, that there are or it's chemical agent uh, related activity that we're dealing with here. Uh, and these are procedures that were set in place back prior to the 2003 um, destruction period where um, it, we had required individuals that were parts of the, the partnership and other stakeholders in the uh, community to include the Restoration Advisory Board to sign non-disclosure statements and so that there was an opportunity for us to provide that information uh, to uh, selected members within the community and within the agencies involved in the cleanup, and we would be more than happy uh, to provide. I uh, don't the understand with the national concern, uh, security concerns at all about World War One weapons. I don't understand that there that 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 is anything but a, a way to keep. Um, the 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 um, information from the public. We're not dealing with weapons that are in use today, and maybe the army would be embarrassed uh, that that these weapons were ever used. But I don't understand national security concerns. It, it What's the national concern concern right. about a World War One uh, weapon, ammunition that certainly isn't any <laughs> used today? It's certainly. Um, uh, has not been used for decades, uh, where you're dealing in the most advanced uh, uh, army and the most advanced uh, scientific country in the world, where these would be, would be a, 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 if anything, um, um, uh, antiques. Mm -hmm. So why not let yes, us know what the antiques yes, are, uh, Ms. Davis? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, if I, if I could, could do two things. One, uh, provide the members of the committee with that list, and, and two, uh, take that uh, back with us and review it internally and get you an answer as quickly as we can. Um, I very much appreciate the notion of providing to the District of yes, Columbia. I understand it. And I understand the district even signs off on didactic materials. It's signing off on right. nothing. Uh, the notion of not even providing between agencies uh, the names of the, uh, what, the, what the materials are and what right. the weapons are this long sure. after the fact. We're almost a century later. Right. No, I understand your point completely, and um, in the spirit of transparency, let me take that one on personally to go back and see if we can uh, work that. Very much appreciate that. Yes, the, uh, you have said, you, you just testified that the work plan um, is available, but we are told, the community tells us that they have not been able to get to see the work plan. See, this is why there is continuing distrust in the community. If there's a plan, if there's a work plan, uh, if we're now supposed to be in an era of transparency, why not share it? In fact, put it online. What's the secret here? Ma'am, there is no secret. The, uh, the work plans that are um, analyzed by the partners that take place at the partnering meetings on a monthly basis that's reviewed. Uh, the Restoration Advisory With Board- With only some people being able to see them in the community and others not? But members of the community through the Restoration Advisory Board are the members that uh, are able to attend those. Also at each of the RAB meetings, there's Carl, this- you're dealing in a community where this information was withheld for decades. You're not, to, you're now about to leave. We, 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 as you leave, surely we could get the greatest transparency possible so that the community would finally have confidence in the work that 
the Corps has done. Now, I don't understand. I'd like you to tell me why only some members of the community can see the work plan. What's secret about the work plan so that you have to have a, a, a security clearance to see it? Ma'am, I will verify that. I have no knowledge of anybody that is required to have a security clearance uh, to well, that, uh, enter you, discussion. You say only so. Have you seen it, Mr. Hawkins? There's more than one uh, document that you're talking about. There are work plans of the actual physical work, what sites are being looked at, where monitoring done. That, as far as I know, is accessible. There, are inf there is information about the munitions that have been found and how it would be res uh, remediated that since I do not have security clearance and I refuse to sign a non-disclosure that said I could not report the information to the mayor, that I don't see, however, well, that's the, what I wanna know. the I Metropolitan know. Police Department well, I mean, and the I, Fire maybe Department. Maybe we're dealing with truly does, Maybe we're dealing with truly dangerous chemicals here because if he's got a, if this is a, a, a city official, and he can't even disclose it to his principal, I don't, I don't, I, 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 and no one can see it but people you designate. Yes, ma'am. We'll, like I said, we'll take that on and go back and, and see if we can't work through it. Congress. Well, man, I also wanted to make a comment on the district's view of, of this concept that in 2010 uh, we'll be walking or anyone will walk away from the site. That is certainly not the district's intention. The, what my experience, and I have to say, Mr. Chair, I was an EPA Superfund uh, lawyer in Boston, in New England, when the licensed site professional program was, was introduced. So I've done these sites as an enforcement lawyer, and they're often iterative. Our view as to what will be completed in 2010 is currently planned work based on the data that is currently in hand. We know that as of today, another round of groundwater sampling, including deep, water, deep groundwater that has not been done before, is about to commence. There's an entire area next to the reservoir that is gonna be geophysically surveyed as well intrusive uh, review done if needed. That data hasn't been collected yet. That may generate an additional round of work that is not currently contemplated. Thereafter, and we're, our view is that that work generated by monitoring that is currently planned does not need to wait, if it is so indicated, until a full RIFS is done, which is a very standard process to take all the information that's been collected, put it into one document, prepare the investigation and the study of what's necessary. That's a standard super fun step. That's unusual in this case because it's being done at the much nearer to the end of the Look, process. All we want to see is what beginning. we can see now. I'm Pardon not asking me? to see what you haven't completed yet. And I Correct. understand what you're saying. I just argue is that there's nothing completed in 2010 except for existing projects that are planned. There's a work plan which some people have seen and some people have not, and that's been the testimony here, Mr. Hawkins. There's been the testimony that some members of this board have seen it and some members have not. Ma'am, if, if I may, every active work plan is available at the repository of the Palisades Library in the community. So the work plans are all available to the public, and there's no requirement for a security clearance to be able to see those work plans. Uh, with, with all due respect, I couldn't find that library with a map. Uh, let, let me just formalize what's just, just happened here. Uh, number one, we need to have the subcommittee uh, informed so uh, we need to have any reports uh, right now I don't believe there's a, re a requirement uh, that you notify Congress so I'm gonna make that request formally on the record uh, secondly you'll receive that request in writing uh, thirdly we're gonna ask uh, we'll, we'll file a a request to declassify uh, the information that might be in your repository with respect to the history uh, of this site and, and what, what weapons, chemical or otherwise, might be stored on the site. Um, that way, it'll actually save you, Mr. Secretary, from making some decision that might not be uh, in line with your superiors. Maybe we just do it that way. Uh, you can short circuit that process greatly for us if you voluntarily offered information that would you know, to address uh, Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton's request, and we would welcome that. Uh, but but we, we want to be notified uh, fully and uh, promptly of any activity on the site and any information that might be available. I, I, I share uh, uh, Ms. Holmes Norton's concerns that we're dealing with war, World War I armaments. Uh, and so the, the declassification should be a fairly simple matter with the passage of time, although I do know that 
in some countries they still store mustard gas as a as an active uh, munition. So, uh, but anyway, we, we want that information. I'd like to, at this point, uh, recognize a gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me start with uh, uh, Secretary Davis. Mr. Davis, um, we have a site in uh, Missouri called the SLAP site, uh, which stands for the St. Louis Army Ammunition plant. Um, could you help me with the follow-up testing on groundwater and um, let me know if it has been done um, with the state-of-the-art isotopic analysis uh, that will be used in Spring Valley and will we or do we already have a, a remedial investigation? Uh, report that summarizes all samplings, all cleanup actions taken and include a baseline human health and environmental risk assessment. Would you be able to provide that to this committee or yes, to me? Sir, what, what we'll do is we'll go back and, and, and do a research on that particular location and provide the information that we have available to you as expeditiously as we can. And if we need to, come over and brief you and your staff. I would appreciate that. You know, um, reading the, the GAO study uh, about the primary threats at the site are buried munitions, elevated arsenic in site zones and laboratory waste, uh, per perchlorate was also found yes, on site. Normally, what should happen? How should how should we deal with this for for a a community? What do we do? What do, to to take them out of danger to get that exposure away from them? What should happen? Yes, sir. Well, I mean, what we've what we've done here is to go through first a detailed archival research effort to try to gain as much information as we could about the site um, to get to the perchlorate issue that you brought up uh, at the end. Uh, we have a series of monitoring wells that are in place right now. Um, we are going to begin another monitoring uh, period this summer uh, to draw samples from those wells. We're going to put in an additional series of wells to give us a better indication of how we can characterize the perchlorate. And the big issue of concern is whether or not it's going to impact on the drinking water supply for the district at the Della Carla Reservoir. Our geophysical assessment right now based on the hydrology of the site indicates that any perchlorate is going to not go into the Della Carla Reservoir, but it may go into the Potomac. And so we believe by enhancing the number of wells and by reinitiating our sampling program that we'll be able to determine better than we know right now uh, what the potential source of that perchlorate might be and where it may be moving underneath um, the surface. With regard to the arsenic remediation, um, that has been a major effort on our part to go out and actually do soil sampling at a multitude of properties on the site and where uh, we have found uh, levels that exceed the EPA standard to go in and remove that arsenic from those sites. In many cases, it means disturbing existing uh, landscaping, which we then go back and uh, work with the landowners uh, to seek restoration. Um, as far as the munitions, uh, in many cases, we, have, we go through a, a variety of, of techniques uh, digital uh, geomapping systems that we've got available that will help us go in and determine where specific anomalies might be that re require excavation uh, from the soil. Uh, in other cases, we will look at uh, other indicators from uh, earlier photographs of the site uh, where we may have uh, depressions or scars in the ground that may give us an indication that there was a burial there of some of these munitions or other munitions related constituents. Um, and again, this is part of the ongoing effort that we have right now, sir. Thank you for that. Let me go to Colonel uh, Mueller real quickly. Um, it was mentioned earlier that um, these cleanup projects are, 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 are in a pinch as far as budgeting concerned, that, they don't, that you don't get enough money uh, to do all of the projects. Is that accurate? Sir, for 
the requirements that we've had at Spring Valley from the Army Corps of Engineers' perspective, uh, we have continued to receive adequate funding for the work that uh, the work plans that we have in place. No, I mean around the country. Uh, I mean, I guess it's just so much money to go around as far as how sir, they sir, if I could interject, since I'm the person, Colonel Mueller has the Baltimore district. Um, oh, I so see. he's dealing with those areas here okay. in the local. But uh, when you look at what we're dealing with nationwide, as was mentioned by the GAO rep mm -hmm. earlier, we've got about you know 4,700 sites out there that are being looked at right now. And uh, our annual budget for the FUDS program in its entirety is about $250 million. Um, with the amount of work that's remaining to be done, uh, the current cost to complete is in excess of $17 billion based on our current estimates. And so it's going to be a while before we get the work completed that needs to be done based on just what we know today. Did, did FUDS receive any additional funding from the um, American Recovery Act? Recovery we did not. And reinvent we did not. We received. RAP did. We did not receive anything. FUSRAP got a bump. In they did. That, yes, sir, they did. But not FUDs, huh? That is correct. We received 30, about $33 million uh, for fiscal year 2009 from the Congress as a plus up. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, $4 million of that went directly to the Spring Valley project. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. And I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Clay. Um, uh, I, I'm, 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 well, I, I like, I would like very much to, to, to um, the question of finality that I'm, <laughs> criteria because that I've been trying to probe. Um, Mr. Hawkins, I understand that the district, um, and I very much appreciate your testimony about fifty thousand. I think it was fifty thousand um, uh, dollars. Normally, uh, when there is such uh, a situation and there's, there's access to a very large state agency. States are larger, state budgets are larger. And I know the district may be at some disadvantage. I appreciate that all three of you have worked in, um, because what I'm looking for is, it, I'm looking for all of you to work together, but all of you to monitor each other. And some of you uh, ha are more able to monitor than others is what I'm, I'm getting at. And I appreciate that the EPA as uh, the testimony Mr. Early says, has uh, worked in partnership with the, the Corps uh, and, and the community and, of course, uh, our own uh, a agency. Um, at the end of the day, who is the regulator? Who signs off? Who decides that uh, the area is clear and safe? Well, as I said in my um, initial testimony, because this is a FUD, um, it is the uh, core who has the lead for the site in EPA. Excuse me, say, say that. I just can't hear you at all. I'm sorry. I said because this is a FUD, the core is responsible, the Army is responsible for taking the lead in EPA as a support agency here. Um, and we've been working no, no, with. No, no, yeah. oh, this, this no. This, this really compounds my question. Because I don't mind the core uh, and the district uh, environmental agency. Uh, in fact, I think there's some good to be said for the technical support. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, and EPA all being, excuse me, in bed together. But you see, you see, when it comes to deciding, someone deciding in an independent fashion that the work is done, I am having trouble finding an independent agent here. From the perspective of the Especially if the core is the lead for its own investigation. I, I would have two comments on that score. Which Mr. Early just said. Core is the lead. Core is the lead and the cleanup. The, the district's view is that the cleanup will not be done until the district agrees that it's done first. And second, my experience on all cleanups is there's no such thing as a done site. One, a very good recommendation was no, made. No, no, I, I accept that, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hawkins, and that's when the testimony here and the monitoring and the testing that will, I, right. I, I accept that. So please forgive our layman's sense right. of done. But the way the way we're coming to done is the community has come to us and said they're going to be done in two years. They're going to be done digging. They're going to be done doing the work they were doing. 
what they will be doing on the, on the site. After that, you say there will be some, it's different. And, and I'm just trying to, I'm trying to put myself in their position, not, you know, and, and I appreciate that you have, have made us understand uh, that there is no, there, there is no leaving, no exit in that sense. Uh, but somebody had to decide that in two years, what is being done now will no longer be necessary. That is what I'm trying to understand. How did that decision get made? On what basis was that decision made? How do we know? How, why not two years ago? Why not four years from now? How did that decision get made? And how will we know uh, once the day that you leave, if you will forgive me, doing what you're doing now and go to the other phase of what you do, how will we know that you should have left at that time? Who will tell us? Ma'am, that is a complicated question because of the different aspects of the project. Clearly there's an answer for that for the arsenic that we are removing and we have removed from 106 properties. Um, there is an answer for the, the uh, munitions and explosives of concern based on the partner's agreement on the 28 areas of interest that we are investigating. And there's another answer for the geophysics that we're looking for for other anomalies on properties. So, ma'am, I don't have an easy answer for that no, other than... Why, I don't understand that that is even a problem. You, you can, <laughs> the, the, whoever is the, quote, decider well, ma can, in fact, can, in fact, get the information. Uh, I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not asking you the, the different kinds of information. I, my question is very simple. It's a very common sense question that a citizen would ask. Who has the independence to make the judgment that the time to quit the phase you're in is over? Who is that entity? Particularly given that the Corps has left twice and had to be called back. And Mr. Hawkins, the fact that they won't go until you say so, it's just not the way the Supremacy Clause works. This is a federal agency. <laughs> and they have left before. So, so the district will continue to say, we find X, Y, and Z here, but this is a federal agency. And therefore, I have got to find what federal entity or independent entity is going to be responsible for making a very critical decision that after more than 15 years of work that has been very controversial, uh, where there is still great dissatisfaction uh, with transparency, where people still don't know what the weapons are, where you're in a residential community, it's fair to ask who is going to make that decision, and how independent is that entity? Ma'am, if I can make, if I yes, can add, add yes, two sir. points to that question. Um, first and foremost, as far as the work that's being done and the planning that goes into that work, I think it's been well stated here in terms of the partnership um, that has been undertaken between EPA, uh, DC, and the Corps of Engineers. The work that's done by the Corps um, is, in fact, uh, done to the appropriate standards established, you know, by EPA. Uh, when we get to a point in time, so EPA, Mr. Mr. Early, you then do an evaluation, uh, a, a, an independent evaluation yourself, uh, as to whether or not the Corps has met those standards. Yes, EPA, we're responsible for reviewing the actions that are proposed, determining what are the applicable standards, both at the federal and the state level, to figure out if there is more stringent standards that the state. Um, has applied that are applicable to the site. And then in our role, um, in terms of concurring, we either concur with what's being proposed in terms of the finality of the action, or we would say that there are some additional things that need to be made to meet the standards that are applying at both the federal and the state so level. So the state has higher standards. In this case, the District of Columbia, they could be adopted. They can. They could have higher standards. They could go beyond and be more stringent than what the federal standards are. And the, and the, and the, the EPA would adopt those standards. Well, we would make sure in terms of any cleanup activities that are being undertaken yes. that that would be complied with over and above the federal standards. Uh, would uh, the partners have an objection to an independent study?
Silence is deafening. Well, I don't see it. I, if, Again, well, you've been, just, you've been just, working very hard. You've been yeah. working very hard. I mean, if um, I could just jump in on that one, we have uh, an independent rep that's part of the uh, Community Restoration Advisory I, Board. Sorry, I, I did there. I say that again. Me, we have an, there's an independent representative that provides input to the community. Uh, Who is that? On behalf of the Restoration Advisory Board, I don't have his name, but I can provide that to you all. Uh, uh, you I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm looking for somebody above it all uh, who will look at the work and say. Right. Um, that the work has been done or not. Yes, ma'am, if I could just continue. When, when the work that has been determined and planned through the work plan gets to a point in time when it is completed, if you will, the investigative work, the removal work um, is done, that any long-term monitoring um, is in place, that is when this process that was mentioned earlier, this remedial investigation feasibility study is done, that basically um, is a very all-encompassing document that will go back and look at all the work that's been done up until that point in time, determine uh, what it achieved or, as Mr. Early said, maybe did not achieve. And from that document, it will give us an indication uh, as to whether or not we need to continue work in certain areas where there may be gaps uh, in the work that had been done. That document will go out um, for public uh, review and comment. And we will, again, take on board the comments from uh, the partners and from the community uh, and then go back and do any additional work that needs to be done that was either not done or was identified that needed to be done as part of this process. Ultimately, though, getting to, your, to the answer to your question, uh, once we reach all of that agreement and the work uh, is completed, then the Corps of Engineers, as the lead agent, will issue a record of decision which will, again, document uh, what work was done to ensure the uh, Did health you issue and such a decision the, the two times you previously left the site? Um, I believe at least on one of those occasions, one was in fact issued. I, well, I'll who, go back and Who verify. evaluated that decision? Well, Did I, the EPA evaluate that decision? It seemed to be its job. Yeah. I'm sorry, when they left, the, when they left right. twice before. Right. Um, I'm not sure, um, based on my consultation, whether or not we concurred on the rod back in uh, 1995 when that happened. Uh, I, I, uh, I can see the position that that we're, we have a, we have the we have the EPA here. We look to the EPA as the federal agency for for environmental matters. I see the relationship, of course, with the state in this case, the dif the, the, the the district. It does seem to me that the that the, 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 some of the problems raised here have been problems about whether or not the EPA, I, I, at least now, is intent upon doing its job as a federal regulatory agency here. Uh, and ultimately, what, the, what they, they, can, they can do their plan and, and, and their decision to leave, as just described, all they want to. But the Corps has no jurisdiction to declare an area environmentally safe at all. They are being regulated as far as we're concerned here. So we have got to look to the EPA, which doesn't have the best reputation in this episode, at least this Spring Valley episode, to do its job. Uh, and, I cannot, uh, and I cannot say to you that I've been convinced yet, we have some time to go, that an independent evaluation will not be necessary. And the reason that would, anybody would even think of that is the sad story of lack of transparency all this time, up to and including what the chairman had to say about finding out what the weapons are, weapons that are so old and obsolete that they cannot possibly be matters of national security, and yet people have been told that that's why they can't know what the weapons are. You see, when you hear that kind of thing, you lose confidence in the process. You think there must be something secret here. You better find out more. They really are hiding things. And that's why I think what the chairman has done to clear the air there is going to be very important to do, unless you can yourself do it. Because, you, because, because it, it is going to be necessary for everything to come out. We don't see any reason why, uh, we're, when we're talking about weapons that are coming up on being a century old, 
uh, that anybody with a straight face would use the word national security concern. We just don't understand it. If you'd explained it in this hearing, uh, I'm on the Homeland Security Committee. I hear legitimate national security concerns at, all the time. I haven't heard any uh, explained here this today. Uh, let me go on to a few more questions. Um, are there any other areas of the District of Columbia where the Army has either any intelligence or any suspicion that there are chemical weapons buried? Ma'am Walder, are there FUDS sites in the district itself, there are no other sites at this point in time that we believe have chemical munitions. You, you, I, I know there were, I know there were, were, were some uh, weapons in northeast. I know there were in southeast where the giant now is. I know that's been cleaned up or the giant wouldn't be there. Um, and I just want to know for the record, are there any more sites where there are weapons? You say there are none. That's your testimony? That is correct, and not, not to my knowledge. And we have, there's one other site that we have in the district that has long-term monitoring underway. It's one of the sites, I think, that you mentioned that had been previously cleaned up. Um, but other than that, no, there are no other sites that we know of mm -hmm. at the present that contain uh, chemical munitions. Has the Corps ever uh, had to use the equipment you proposed to use uh, in Spring Valley to destroy uh, weapons uh, in a residential community before or close to a residential community? Ma'am, the, the technology we're going to use for the destruction is similar to the technology that was used in Spring Valley in a residential setting back in 2003 uh, when we destroyed 15 chemical munitions. So you're using the self-same equipment to, to destroy these, 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 um, this ordinance that you have all along been using? or have used before here? That is correct. We've done over 1,500 destruction missions with this equipment without incident. Uh, finally, um, uh, could I ask you, uh, Mr. Early, why um, Spring Valley has not been on your national priorities list? Um, it's, it's our position that the it hasn't, at this point in time, been necessary to put Spring Valley um, on the national priority list, although that is an option that we continue to look at. Um, based upon the experience that the agency um, has with um, Spring Valley and the, the, the partnership that we have developed um, in terms of the checks and balances that I think that we've developed and the fact that the, the Spring Valley site has been given priority at funding with regard to the cleanup um, at, at the Army as well as sufficient funds being provided by EPA to make sure that um, the work is done in an appropriate manner um, we haven't seen fit to to list the site on the NPL. So it's not dangerous enough at this point, so far as you, I mean. Well, we think the site is being adequately. We think the site is being adequately addressed in terms of the funding and the resources that are being devoted to the site at this point in time. Um, as I said, this is something that we continue to monitor in the event that we think that that is not the case. Um, that is an option that the agency is prepared to consider. The, the final question for me, the one an unanswered question that, uh, that I certainly uh, have been and do not understand, ha has to do with the troubling, um, the troubling uh, levels of perchlorate that have been found um, in the groundwater. Um, I, I do not believe a source has been identified, uh, and it's hard to understand. Uh, how you're leaving the area with perchlorate having been found in the groundwater, uh, and we don't even know where it's coming from? Could you explain? I mean, if I could just elaborate on that a little bit. Of all the, the wells we have in place there, we did have two detections, one at about 144 parts per billion, which was in the vicinity of Glenbrook Road monitoring well on uh, in the AU area. We had another well, the Sunday Sibley Hospital that had. I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying to find a source. Right. And Is that's first and foremost, the, the wells are helping us detect where the perchlorate might be located. And then from that, uh, we have procedures that we will use. So, to wait, try wait a minute. So, stop so I can understand, please. So, 
the wells are helping us to understand yes. where it's located. We don't know where the perchlorate comes from. Not at the present. And that's the purpose of uh, the additional monitoring uh, procedures that we will uh, undertake this summer with the emplacement of some additional monitoring wells. Some of these wells are going to be at a deeper depth. And again, what we're really trying to do is to kind of achieve what you are talking about, and that's to determine what is the source. But at the same time, we want to try to do, you know, kind of map underneath the, the surface where we think the perchlorate is moving is and where it came from. Is that the most serious problem you will have to continue to monitor? Long term at this point, it will yeah. be. Mm -hmm. whenever, whenever there's, yes, yes, Mr. Mr. Hawkins? I was, going to, I was going to agree that, that the reason that our view is that it's premature to say that activities at the site are at a closing point because the second, this round of monitoring for perchlorate that has been planned, including deep well, is exactly as you've suggest, has been suggested, to attempt to find the source. If a source is found, absolutely there's new steps of work that will be needed to remove that source, and we just do but, not know that. I mean, yet. we don't even know if it's ordinance. Or if it's from this, the source that, that is correct. The sources that the Army Corps has, has been uh, trying to rid us of. We don't we even do know not. that. They could be from something else. That is correct. Um, at, well, that is obviously very disturbing because this is when we found it. Uh, finally, could you tell me how the members, uh, this, this uh, board, this residential advisory board, is very controversial in the commu community, yet it was established in order to, to establish communication with the community. How were the members appointed? How were they chosen? Ma'am, the community chooses, chooses uh, their uh, representatives for the committee. They have 14 community members. What do they do? Have an election? Yes, ma'am. They have an election? Or they choose who the members of the, uh, the residential advisory board would be? I thought you, you had something to do with that. Ma'am, the, the Army Corps of Engineers is a member of the, the RAB, a non-voting member, but the community maintains or obtains 14 of their own members. Um, no, I'm just trying to find out. Who appoints them? I know where they come from. Who appoints them? So the Army Corps of Engineers does not appoint uh, members of the RAB. All right, somebody tell me, who appoints them? Somebody has to be the appointing authority. I'm just trying to find who that is. Ma'am, we, when the, Re the Restoration Advisory Board was originally established in 2001, we did recruit the initial members, asked for community members who was interested. But after that initial um, time in 2001, they identify their own. They seek the, the... They, 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 after the... So you appointed the first ones. Thereafter, uh, as people left, then who was the, the decision maker? The RAB members themselves. Oh, I see. From, from, from in, I see. From, the, from inside the board itself. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you very much. We've kept you um, a long time because this is a, co a complicated issue and we have appreciated your patience in answering questions. Panel is dismissed and we ask for the next panel thank you. to come forward. It, it's okay. So we'll do this whole thing, then we'll flip back. Uh, if you come forward, we we will swear you in quickly.